The Tudor History and Travel Show is a podcast that brings Tudor history to life by exploring Tudor places and artefacts in the flesh. You will be travelling through time with Sarah Morris, the Tudor Travel Guide, uncovering the stories behind some of the most amazing Tudor locations and objects in the UK. Because when you visit a Tudor building, it is only time and not space which separates you from the past. And now over to your host, Sarah Morris. Hello, dear listener, and welcome to this month's episode of the Tudor History and Travel Show. Of course, it's Sarah, the Tudor Travel Guide here, here to take you on another exciting adventure through time. And in fact, this month, we do have a very special series of podcasts coming your way, all to celebrate the anniversary of one of the most important dates in the Tudor calendar, the 22nd of August, 1485, which of course commemorates the Battle of Bosworth Field, in which the Yorkist house fell to the House of Lancaster as Henry Tudor was finally victorious over King Richard III. To commemorate this historic event, I'm going to be releasing a series of three podcasts over the next few days. The first podcast follows King Richard III as he arrives in the city of Leicester and marks some of the most important places in Leicester associated with the run-up to the battle. In the second podcast, which will be dropped on the anniversary of the battle itself, the 22nd of August, I will be visiting Bosworth Battlefield Heritage Centre for a guided tour around the battlefield. And then finally, of course, there is the aftermath. So the following day, I'll be dropping the third and final podcast in this series, in which I follow the victorious Henry Tudor as he brings Richard's body back to Leicester for display and then ultimately, of course, for burial in the friary of Great Friars in the centre of the medieval city of Leicester. Now, because of the momentous anniversary, I am going to be releasing all three podcasts to the world at large. And I just wanted to take this opportunity before we get going to thank all those at Leicester and also at the Heritage Centre at Bosworth Battlefield for helping me organise this series of recordings. And of course, you will be meeting our guides along the way. In Leicester, our blue badge guide, Steve Bruce, shows us around all the important locations in the city associated with Richard's time, both before and after the battle. Then at Bosworth Battlefield Heritage Centre, Harry Marr takes us on a guided walk of the battlefield site and explains all the events that unfolded. And then finally, also back at Leicester, we visit, of course, Leicester Cathedral, the final resting place where Richard's body was reinterred relatively recently. And our guide there is Rebecca Hale. Okay, well, I think that's all I have to say. This is an epic adventure. I so enjoyed recording this and learnt so much. And it was great to visit some places in Leicester that, in fact, I'd never been to before, despite having lived there for a number of years. So I'm not going to keep you waiting any longer, my friend. Let's go time travelling together. Welcome, dear listeners, to the city of Leicester. Now, this is a city I know well as I went to university here, but today I am back with your company to go in the footsteps of Richard III and, of course, the pretender to the English throne, Henry Tudor. Yes, we are on the anniversary of the Battle of Bosworth, the 22nd of August, 1485. For a long time now, I have wanted to come to Leicester and walk in the footsteps of Richard as he arrives in the city here and prepares himself to meet what would become his nemesis at the Battle of Bosworth Field. Now, 
you join me standing directly outside the King Richard III Centre for, as you know, just a few years ago, Richard III's body was discovered here, buried under a car park in Leicester. And as a result, of course, his body was subsequently reburied in Leicester Cathedral and a wonderful visitor centre was erected here directly opposite it. Over the course of two days of recording, we are going to be following Richard as he prepares for the battle in Leicester, travels out to meet Henry Tudor at Bosworth, and then the aftermath of the battle as his body is brought back to Leicester for burial at Grey Friars. And along the way, we are going to be joined by a number of different local experts and guides who will help us recreate the drama of the 48 hours that changed English history. So, my friends, it is time to go time travelling. But remember, we are recording in the middle of Leicester city centre, and so you will be hearing all sorts of noises of the city going about its everyday business. But we are now ready. And so, without that, I would like to introduce you to our first expert guide. So I'm standing here directly outside the King Richard III Visitor Centre with Steve. Steve Bruce, hello. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us on this podcast, for the beginning of this podcast and indeed the end of the story as well. It's my pleasure, Sarah. Now, before we get going, because we're going to go on a, a walking tour of the city, because there is a King Richard III trail, right, in Leicester? There is indeed, yes. And you're going to help us go on that trail, tell us the story of the build-up to the battle and, and also its aftermath. But before that, perhaps you could just tell people a little bit about yourself. Well, I've lived in Leicester all my life, and uh, even as a boy, we were very well aware of Richard III's connections with Leicester. Um, I used to go to school uh, down a, a road that was named after him, that still exists today, and across the Bow Bridge, which is very uh, integral to the Richard story and Leicester. Then I had the opportunity in 1994 of studying to be a Blue Badge tourist guide, uh, which I have been for the last 30 years. And of course it became very exciting when in 2012 the King's remains were found and all of a sudden, for the first time really, Leicester was on the tourist map. Certainly is, I know. It's 48 hours to go. I think it's the 20th of August, 1485. That's it, yes. We are going to start off at the beginning of the trail. Yes. And as we go, I'm going to be asking you lots of questions about Good. what was happening, and you're going to be showing us some of the main sites associated with Richard's time in the city. Absolutely, yes. So where do we start? Uh, we're going to start uh, outside the site of one of the medieval inns in Leicester, the Blue Boar Inn. Wonderful, because I've heard about the Blue Boar Inn and I've wanted for ages to know exactly where it is, so perhaps we could just get going. And along the way, I'll ask some questions about Richard, Richard's arrival in the city. Yes, that's absolutely Okay, fine, lead, yes. lead the way, Steve. We're heading this way. So, why did Richard come to Leicester? Richard became aware of a rebellion being planned by Henry Tudor, uh, who was in France at the time. And uh, Henry Tudor uh, came to, um, uh, to England. He came the long way round, actually. He sailed right along the south coast, round Cornwall, and landed in Wales. And one of the theories behind that is that he needed to pick up support mm. as, as he travelled, as well as the supporters that were with him. And um, as he was a Welshman, passing through Wales to collect support would have been the, uh, the, the sensible yeah. thing to do. Mm -hmm. And he arrived in Milf Milford Haven a few days uh, before um, Richard's arrival here in Leicester. And I think the messengers would have been very busy relaying information to King Richard that uh, his, uh, his close rival for the throne uh, was in the country and... Um, planning to travel down uh, towards London. And where did Richard come from? Was he in London or was he further north? No, he was further north. Mm. Uh, he was in Nottingham 
uh, and um, he was aware of the journey, the direction that Henry Tudor was travelling. Mm. Uh, essentially, it was down the uh, old Roman road, the Watling Street, right. um, uh, making his way uh, towards London. So Richard's job really was to head off Henry at the first practical point. So you've got Henry coming from towards the, um, uh, the southwest and Richard coming south and inevitably at some point mm. they, they were going to meet. Right, OK. And of course, as you say, constantly messengers relaying. So they would have known they were getting closer to each other. I think so, yes. yes. And for those people who are not that familiar with English geography, Leicester is... Um, south of Nottingham so of yes. course that makes a lot of sense he's coming south from Nottingham yes. and then he I, I suppose Leicester was the biggest city closest city to where he was aware Henry was heading towards and where he might intercept him y yes exactly yes yes so this is the original medieval centre of Leicester is it right and we're walking along the main uh, north south road we're going walking north if you walk far enough the, the other direction, you finish up in London. Is that so? So Yes. Well, maybe this is a good time to ask you about the old city, the layout yeah, yes. of Leicester. Okay, yeah. So was it a walled city? You said a north-south. That, that, that reminds me of many cities where you have a north-south, east-west and gates associated with it. Yes, was that, was it's, that... it's classic, yes, yeah. yes. And the, 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 the town as it was then, uh, we didn't become a city until the 1920s, um, the, the town uh, was walled on at least three sides there's some conjecture as to whether there was a wall on the west side because the principal um, barrier, if you like, on the west side, the principal protective barrier, was in fact the river, which we shall see uh, very shortly. I see. Also, we did have a castle which was still um, in place from the Norman times, although by uh, Richard III's day, Leicester Castle had long passed the, uh, the prominent, uh, really important days of the castle when we had the Earls of Leicester, uh, who also carried the title Earl of Lancaster and then Duke of Lancaster. They were men who were very, very closely related to Kings of England. So in the previous century, in the 1300s, we'd had lots of visits here by, uh, by the monarch. And uh, all of that really stopped in 1399, when Henry IV became King of England. And uh, so, by 1485, when, when Richard was, uh, was, was finally here, or here for his final visit, uh, the castle had already begun to, to fall from importance and prominence, um, which probably explains, or is one of the reasons why, he stayed at the Blue Boar Inn uh, rather than at the castle, which would have been the natural place for him to stay as King of England. I'm glad you brought up the Lancastrian connection because I was aware of that. And there's some important Lancastrians buried in the city, aren't there? Can you remind us who they are? Yeah, they're very important people. Um, Henry, Duke of Lancaster, uh, he was, was buried here. Um, John of Gaunt, who at one time acted as regent when Richard II came to the throne as, as a boy, uh, he was a member of the royal family and held the titles Earl of Leicester and Duke of Lancaster. Uh, so uh, he spent a lot of time here in Leicester uh, and it's believed that he died at Leicester Castle, although I don't believe that he was actually buried here. Uh, and, and of course family members of the Lancastrians also um, would, would have been buried here in um, uh, what effectively was a mausoleum uh, to the, the Lancastrians and which disappeared completely during the dissolution of the monasteries later in history. So there's nothing to be seen of the place in which they were buried now here in Leicester? A tiny, tiny amount, okay. but we'll come to that later. Okay, well let's leave that. Now, as we approach this spot that we're standing on, people will hear it's a busy place. We're right in the middle of Leicester city centre um, and I can see a cross that is labelled the High Cross and you were saying this was the centre of medieval Leicester. So could you possibly paint a picture of what we might have seen if we could dissolve sort of five hundred years in time and come back here? Well, you would have seen very narrow streets, very crowded streets, uh, quite a bustling place because Leicester has always been a market town ever since the Romans were here. Uh, and today there's very, very little um, in, in the way of physical evidence that you can see of those, of those days. But if you do look very carefully, here and there you just get an occasional medieval building, like for example the one sandwiched between <laughs> the two brick buildings just 
across there. I, I, I was just eyeing that up over your shoulder yes. thinking, oh, that, that looks rather nice. <laughs> yes, uh, and that's actually, that's only one of about four half-timbered buildings that you'll find in the centre of Leicester. So, you know, we're not a, a, a Stratford, we're not a Chester or, or anything like that. What you see today is the product, really, of an industrialised um, 19th and 20th century city. But just here and there, we've managed to hang on to little snippets that help us join the dots of our history. Yeah. So the Blue Boar, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm standing in the middle of a very open space at the moment. We're looking, as you say, we're looking northwards down a road, yes. heading north. Where was the Blue Boar? Uh, it's a little further along the, uh, the road to the north, uh, just out of sight because there's a slight bend in the road to the left and it's opposite that bend where we'll find the site of the Blue Boar. Is that where we're going That's next? where we're heading right, next, let's yes. Go, let's go. And so you were saying this is this road heads north where would we go if we just carried on moseying along this road back in 1485 uh, well we'd finish up in places like uh, nottingham uh, and then um, either the option to go uh, continue uh, directly north up to sheffield leeds and yorkshire or uh, you take a, a fork in the road a little further away and uh, that takes you up to lancashire manchester okay so great so Richard would have been coming, when he arrived in the city, coming down He would have been coming us, towards us, literally yes. Literally riding yes. with his entourage. Yes. Speaking of entourage, who was with Richard at this point? Yeah, he, he came with... Uh, 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 with people who were already with him from the North Midlands and because of the situation of Leicester pretty much in the centre of the country uh, this was a good meeting point for other significant um, uh, followers together with uh, with their entourages uh, John Howard, Duke of Norfolk for example and Henry Percy from Northumberland the plan was to have a, a, a big meet up here uh, and it's possible that uh, the, the town probably wouldn't have been big enough to to um, uh, to house all of these mm. soldiers, so they would have stayed in the outer suburbs. So another reason why Richard might have favoured the Blue Boar Inn as his overnight stay was so that he was relatively close to his uh, his, his supporters, his soldiers, uh, who probably camped just outside the north wall, outside ah, the north gate. Right, so the north wall is just a little bit further along? Just a little bit where... further down, yes. You won't find any evidence no. of it today. The only evidence that you'll find uh, is the name of a street which is Northgate Street. Right, it's always a clue. <laughs> yes. Yes. Always a clue. Yes. Okay, now I can. <laughs> Today we are standing outside a very modern building um, in a very modern car park, but I can see an information board on the side of the building saying the Blue Boar and a lovely illustration of what that might have looked like. How do we know the Blue Boar Inn was there, by the way? Are there maps that survive of the city from that period, or is it more a case of deduction? Uh, no, there are maps. Um, it was here until the early part of the 19th century. Oh, really? Quite late? Yes, yes. And the area where we're standing now was a tiny little lane um, which went all the way down to the river, and this was called Blue Boar Lane. So we're, we're, we can be pretty certain as to where the Blue Boar Inn stood. So do we have any evidence that Richard stayed at the Blue Ball. Where does that story well, come it, from? It, it is mentioned in accounts um, and uh, the, logically this the story works that, that he would have stayed here. It, it, for its day it was a reasonably high status place um, as well and uh, I think that had he stayed for example at Leicester Castle there would have been records of that at the castle itself. So I think we're fairly comfortable that, that he was here at the, at the Blue Boar Inn. Now we've, we've drifted over towards the board which um, there'll be a picture of this in the show notes page just so you can see what we're looking at because it, I, I think um, this is a depiction or a, a, a yes. kind of a fantasy depiction but an idea of what the blue board I would have looked it, I like. I think it's a reasonable idea yes because it was it was in existence until the early 19th century um, on this site uh, and, uh, and then uh, a, a new inn um, elsewhere uh, not too far from here in the city centre a new inn was built and the, the name Blue Boar Inn went with that inn 
um, as, as well. I see. It's a rather stirring picture, obviously, of Richard outside. I couldn't help just reading the words here that said he brought along his own bed because allegedly he, quote, slept ill in strange beds. And it goes on to say his bed was supposedly left at the inn, perhaps with the intention of the king would return there after the battle. Do we, there is a picture of bed here. Do we know what happened to that bed? Uh, the answer to that is, is no. Uh, there is um, uh, another site in Leicestershire which claims to carry Richard III's bed, but that's been carefully examined by experts and the various components of it don't actually date to, uh, okay. uh, to around this time. Yeah. One of many, many um, quirky stories and interesting myths that have been built up around the king over the years. Yeah, absolutely. But the, as you said, there are accounts because it said the room he stayed in was described as a large, gloomy chamber. Yes, yes, and the fact that it was a, a large chamber yeah. is indicative of the, you know, of the status of the place. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, this building survived, as you said, until what the 19th century? Did you say? Until yes, the yes, 1800s? into the 1800s. Yes. And yes. was it just falling apart, or was it just part of city redevelopment? And they thought, well, this well, I is... think it was probably a little bit of both. Um, when the Victorians um, started to rebuild the, the, the city centre here, uh, that was the first swathe, if you like, of the old medieval buildings that, uh, that Leicester lost as, as, we, as we took on our uh, industrial mantle. OK. Well, well, we've got a lot of ground to cover this morning, so I think we probably need to get on our way. So where do we need to go to next? Uh, well, the next place we're going to is we're going to follow the steps that Richard took when he left Leicester to travel over towards um, Bosworth, where he was hoping that he would coincide with the march of Henry coming down to the southwest. OK, brilliant. And as we go, I've got a few more questions yeah. to ask you. Yeah, just before we go, though, you might be interested, a little quirk. Uh, this was another inn. So there was an inn right. on this site. This was the Admiral Rodney. OK, right. So his, some of his supporters would have been in there as well, no Probably, doubt. Probably, yes. So are there any records of what Richard did that evening? Did he go, for example, to the cathedral to hear mass? Do we know anything of what he... I've never seen anything of, of, of that much detail, no. Right. No. You can only imagine, can't you, the discussions and the, the plotting and the planning yes. that must have been going on yes, and the it, it, messengers it, arriving. It, it must have been quite fraught, yes. The tension building. I think it's, it's virtually impossible for anybody who hasn't, I guess, served in the armed forces to have any idea of what it must have been like to be thinking about heading to the battlefield. Yes, and, and this, remember, is, um, is, is closely fought hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat yeah. uh, so um, yes um, uh, pretty terrifying and um, the stakes of course were enormous the, uh, the, the throne the King of England Yes. Which side are you on then, Steve? You, I sit firmly in the middle. Are you if I... <laughs> I sit firmly in the middle. Uh, well, I, I think I do know why. I think my job is to be impartial. Um, and although I'm Leicester through and through, one of the, uh, um, one of the attributes, I think, of, of Leicester people is to um, just try and find uh, a nice, comfortable place you know, in, in the centre of things. In the centre ground. <laughs> yes, yes. And if I was strongly in favour of one side or the other, then I'd probably half the number of times that I was able to speak to people because I've taken people round who are strong Yorkists or, and others who um, more favour the Lancastrian side. Um, and uh, I think it's 
it's wrong in and as, as Leicester had in a sense a foot in both camps mm. um, I, I think it's wrong for me to take sides uh, otherwise so Steve we've been walking down through the city um, I, I presume we're traveling in a westward direction yes we've walked west uh, and we are now crossing what was at one time part of the river in Leicester but for many years now has been um, part of the Grand Union Canal uh, uh, network a across the country and we've actually now crossed out of the old medieval city ah. of, of Leicester. Okay so it would have been open fields and maybe a smattering of houses around. Yes just the occasional uh, um, cottage or, or farmstead here or there yes. It's hard to believe as dear listeners we're right next to it and you will hear this we are right next to a dual carriageway so this is one of the kind of the main thoroughfare heading out of Leicester to the west I guess so it is quite noisy uh, but we want to head down to well you tell us where we're heading down to. yes we're heading down to um, a little tributary uh, of the river um, which for many many years has called uh, been called Bowbridge in an early incarnation back in medieval times that's literally what it was uh, it was a single span wooden bow bridge over the river saw right okay and I see we've got the Richard III Road there, signposted. Yes, Richard III Road is a very new uh, road in Leicester. Um, but what we are facing now, uh, across Bowbridge, is the old Victorian King Richard's Road, which uh, stretched out towards the growing western suburbs in the 19th century. So here we are, Bowbridge, you've got another plaque to tell you you're in the right place. Yes. And I guess something that's a little bit misleading here, because there's another stone plaque that says, near this spot lie the remains of Richard III, the last of the Plantagenets. Well, I guess they were right, but maybe, I don't know, half a mile out. Well, this stone plaque uh, uh, actually um, uh, uh, tells us that for many years there was a local myth uh, which found its way into most of the history books, that during the time of the Reformation, Richard's body was dug up from the Greyfriars Priory uh, and carried gleefully down here to the river and thrown into the river here. Okay, so that's where that part of the story comes from. I've never heard of that. Haven't that's very really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's so nice, though, to know that we've actually got a final conclusion and we know that's... Yes. There's so many times in history where you have a legend or a myth and you can't prove it. Yes. Think princes in the tower for yes. example which yes. still ignites a lot of controversy despite Absolutely. the latest findings anyway here we've got the i can see the picture is, it, is this was this what bowbridge actually used that was to what bowbridge uh, uh, looked like when they re rebuilt the original timber bridge in stone so probably this is what it would have looked like when richard crossed so we've got a tiny little stone that uh, a stone bridge with several arches here and again there'll be a picture in the show notes page should you want to see that but uh, yeah, just a trifle different to the, the main road that we've got going on today. And there's some decoration on the bridge, which obviously must commemorate Richard. Uh, yes, there is. And you can see the, the, the decoration... Yes, uh, just here. ...live in front of you here, yes. So we've got some red roses. We've got some white roses of York. Yeah, now you've fallen and into... Royal, you've, I'm, I'm going to correct you there, oh, Sarah, you? because you? you have fallen into the trap. Are we? Right. Uh, and it's a trap that the people who actually put these information boards up have fallen into as well. Uh, uh, because what we have here, alternately, are um, Tudor roses uh, interspersed with the Norman uh, five-petaled flower, the Sankfoil, of the Beaumont Earls, who were the Norman Earls of Leicester. Right, yeah, I was going to ask, because I didn't know what that was. So yeah. I presume that yeah. that must be the White Rose of York, though, uh, right? No, that's another Tudor rose. Is you look carefully, that's about the same. Yeah. As, what happened was, um, because all of this was uh, going to be uh, shown, you know, smartly on television at the time of the funeral and so on, uh -huh. uh, it was given a nice lick of paint. <laughs> and my theory is that in the interests of neutrality, <laughs> some of the Tudor roses they painted red and some they painted white okay so it's quite interesting that the red roses obviously from the house of lancaster i.e henry tudor's side commemorate a bridge that is more linked to richard the yes Bird. yes 
<laughs> okay, right. But you do have the royal. I see you do have the royal standard. Over that, yeah, there. that's in the centre. Yes, yeah, yes. Okay. Richard's uh, uh, Richard's emblem. Yes. So yes. on the twenty first of August, fourteen eighty five. If we'd been loitering here, we yes. would have seen Richard in his armour. Yes, on his white charger, uh, departing Leicester. With all yes. his entourage following him, wondering yes. what lay ahead of him at Bosworth Battlefield. Yes. And it was here that uh, a famous incident, which much of which has been made of throughout history, uh, took place, and it's recorded on the other side of the bridge. This bridge that you see now dates from the middle of the 19th century. Uh, it, they, uh, they demolished the, um, the stone bridge and built a wider one because it was, this was the time when the west side of Leicester was developing and they needed a much bigger and stronger bridge. And uh, it just goes to show that even in those days we were very well aware of King Richard because what happened to him and what is alleged to have happened to him on this bridge is recorded on a plaque from uh, when this bridge was first built. I think built. I know what you're talking about. Let's go round and have a look. I see a plaque. Can I read it? Please do, yes. Okay, yes. here we go, folks. Upon this bridge, as tradition hath delivered, stood a stone of some height against which King Richard, as he passed towards Bosworth, by chance struck his spur, and against the same stone, as he was brought back, hanging by the horse side, his head was dashed and broken. As a wise woman forsooth had foretold, who before Richard's going to battle, being asked of his success, said that where his spur struck his head should be broken. Speed's history of Great Britain. Oh my word. Yes. That's giving me a bit of tickles, actually. It, it, yes, it's, it's amazing, yes, that that's uh, recorded and, and gone through time. Uh, and. Um, Interesting to me that this commemoration was put here, as I say, in the middle of the 19th century. OK, well, um, I feel compelled to follow in Richard's footsteps and head out to Bosworth, which is where we're going to go next. But I believe you'll be meeting us here again to pick up the story as Richard comes back into the city after the Battle of Bosworth. Yes, I'll see you after your visit to Bosworth. OK, cheerio. See you soon. Goodbye. Well, my friends, as you can hear, tensions are running high as we march out towards Bosworth to meet with Henry Tudor. And if you join me tomorrow, the 22nd of August, I will be meeting Harry Marr, our guide at Bosworth, who is going to take us around the battlefield site to learn about all the events that transpired and all the key figures involved. Also, We'll learn about what you can see if you want to visit the Visitor Centre for yourself. So stay tuned. That second episode is coming your way very soon. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Tudor History and Travel Show. If you've loved the show, please take a moment to subscribe, like and rate this podcast so that we can spread the Tudor love. Until next time, my friends, all that remains for me to say is happy time travelling.
Thank you.